Hello, everyone. Welcome to Advanced Tips and Tricks for Social Media. We'll just wait a few minutes here to let folks get settled. But if you could find that question chat box and share where you're from, I'd love to say hello to so many of you who are joining us today. We've got a large number of registrants, and I thank you for taking the time to spend it with us and maybe learn something new about social media. So we have Alicia from North Carolina, Catherine from Louisiana, Lorraine from Mississippi, Pamela from California, Kyle from Arkansas, Thania from California, Kathy from Illinois, Kathleen from Michigan, Rhonda from Kentucky, Heather. We have a really good female contingent here today. Heather from Arizona, Carrie from Kansas, Gail from Ohio, Doug from Washington, Marissa from Wyoming, Elizabeth from Florida, Karen from Arizona. It's so awesome. I love seeing familiar faces and names here. And I want to welcome everyone to the webinar. My name is Jennifer Wilson. I work for the Illinois State Water Survey. But this webinar is co-sponsored by two of our programs, wateroperator.org and the private well class. So throughout the presentation, you'll see examples related to public drinking water and wastewater, as well as related to private well and environmental health issues. So I want to welcome both of those communities. And we're really trying to hard, trying hard to get these communities to talk to each other because we know how important it is to share that expertise. Some of the more, you know, technical expertise that the drinking water community has and the public health risk communication experience that the environmental health community has, we know how vital it is for those folks to be talking to each other. And social media is of course, one of the best places to do that and to make connections with broader groups who share similar passions and interests um, in this professional space. All right, so if you are interested in continuing education, whether drinking water CEUs or environmental health CEs, you can request a certificate for attending the webinar by emailing info at wateroperator.org. We'll verify your attendance that you were here for, you know, 99% of the time, and we will email you back a certificate with your name and, you know, the date of attendance and all that. Um, if you do have a NEHA credential, we have requested and just received moments ago one and a half CEs for NEHA credential holders. So if that is your credential, please let us know in your email and we'll send you the form to fill out and sign. And then we'll re in return sign that for you so you can turn that into NEHA. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be published on YouTube as well as posted to the wateroperator.org and privatewellclass.org websites. But unfortunately, we cannot provide you a certificate for watching the recording because we have no way of tracking that. So I, a lot of you already found the, the question chat box so that you could share your location, but this is the place where you can at any time during the presentation, submit your questions for me to answer at the end of the presentation. Um, I have actually peppered a lot of the questions you submitted in advance throughout the presentation and included some at the end, but we'll do our best to answer as many additional questions as we can at the end. You know, this is your opportunity to share some of your challenges and concerns and ask how someone else might approach a situation when it comes to social media. So again, my name is Jennifer Wilson. I've been the communications coordinator for wateroperator.org since the website's inception in 2011 and private well class since 2014. But I've been working in the drinking water space since 2004, and I've been on social media for a really long time, since 2008. And while I don't consider myself the world's foremost expert, I have a lot of experience uh, in doing social media for the domains we're talking about today. And I think I'll have a lot of strategies that maybe you may not be as familiar with or ones maybe you've never even heard of before. And that's what I wanna sh share in today's presentation. So one of the questions we got was how and why does your organization use social media? So I just wanted to briefly share what it is that we do if you're not as familiar. So here we have the Twitter profiles for the private well class and wateroperator.org. Our handle on Twitter is uh, help for well owners with the number four for private well class and help for small water for wateroperator.org. 
On Twitter, we mostly communicate with our other peers in the sphere. And I know that's a lot of you here on the webinar today. Um, for private wells, it's environmental health professionals, well contractors and professionals, regulators, and for wateroperator.org, it's the same type of people, but often in different agencies. So the drinking water and wastewater regulators, technical assistance providers, you know, even federal agencies, all of our partners in the sphere of, of helping get safe water to the public at large. Now, Facebook tends to be a little bit different. And you'll hear this word, I'm gonna just use the word the public a lot because my the public and your the public is gonna look a little bit different. Every organization has a different audience that's there, the main group that they're serving, and that's your public. And so I wanna keep you, keep this in mind throughout the presentation. So, but we use Facebook mostly for communicating with the public, you know, and that's our public, because that's where people are expecting to receive that type of information. They're not expecting to receive uh, as much business or professional type information. That's where they're sharing pictures of their kids and, and commenting on issues that they care about. And so for private well class, we're primarily talking to well owners and well users, because we can't forget that not everyone who has a well owns their home. And for wateroperator.org, we're talking to water system operators, utility managers, board members, and other community members who are stakeholders when it comes to the public drinking water and wastewater systems. We're also dabbling a little bit in LinkedIn. It's something that's newer to us. And you know, it's an interesting thing because that's really the professional space. Um, so we have there as a, an organization page. And I think LinkedIn is interesting because you're, you're talking in this professional ca capacity, but both to your peers and to the public and these various different spheres of you know, acting as a professional. So you're going to find fewer memes, fewer silly things, and it's gonna be, it's a more serious environment in general. And of course, a place to make those connections to advance your career. All right, so I think why we use social media is a couple purposes and, and, and our reasons behind it. We wanna reach new audiences with our programs. We want to help more people get educated and use the resources we have available. For the private well class, we have, that's why it's called the private well class, we have a 10 week email course. Um, and we also do webinars an hour, you know, it's at least monthly and sometimes twice a month. And for wateroperator.org, we have an amazing uh, event calendar and resource library that is national in scope, constantly updated by our amazing team. And we want people to be coming back to our website and using those resources because that's why they're there. I will say that social media is also a, a side note to what we do. And we really consider to our email newsletters to be central to what we do and the main way we communicate with our existing audience to remind them that we exist and to take advantage of what we have available for free. However, I think the social media aspect helps to remind, is another way of reminding and as I said, helping it reach new audiences by having our existing audience share those posts. Our participation on social media also helps to amplify voices of our partners and their activities and to, to showcase things that are going uh, nationally, regionally, or even hyper-locally. Sometimes we share examples of here's a great way that you can engage your public on this particular issue. And we also use it to stay up on industry news and trends. You know, we get a lot of email ourselves and sometimes it's easier to find what's the latest and greatest or what's the most, what people are most interested in by paying attention to social media to see what they are talking about. And then with that information, and I think this is a key point that I want you to take through this presentation is what are those problems that you're noticing as you're paying attention and how can your organization uniquely help that? There's always going to be lots of ways that you could help and ways that other people are helping, but how can your organization uniquely help? Where do you sit within the scope of all the organizations, all the partners that are doing the same thing? And what's your special sauce, if you will, and how can you do even more of that? 
So we also had another question of what evaluation metrics do you use to show engage engagement and demonstrate behavior change? So I'm just gonna mention a couple of those. We use account follows, post reach, video views, website visits, webinar attendees, class enrollments, post class evaluations, brochures requested, questions received, and customer satisfaction surveys. And so we have a whole section later on all about metrics. And this is just a snapshot of what we use, what we use to uh, improve what we do to evaluate the effectiveness of, of what we're doing and also to report to our funders. And I wanted to call a specific attention to the two items in bold, because those are two specific ways that we use to evaluate behavior change. Um, that's one of the hardest things to determine um, our post-class evaluation for the private well class asks, have you taken any actions after uh, completing our class to, for example, test your well water, install a treatment system, get additional information? And so that's one of the most vital things that we use. And then we also use customer satisfaction surveys. So I know that I'm probably talking to a lot of agencies you know, local government organizations that may have restrictions depending on the type of funding that you have and also your affiliations. So for us, we have, because we're under a federal grant, our partner is RCAP, the funding comes from EPA, um, we have to oblige by OMB's Paperwork Reduction Act so that we're reducing the burden on our partners. And so that means we have basically, if you want to do a survey, you have to get extensive approval to do that. So we don't do real surveys. Um, and for example, because we're also a university, we're bound by human subjects research regulations to make sure that we are protecting the people who are answering the surveys. So a customer satisfaction survey is a way to gather information while still being in compliance with those regulations. Because if you limit the number of people that you're asking, as well as only keep that information to yourself internally for improving your program. It's a way to gain that information and see what is happening without um, providing that, without being a burden and without, you know, potentially putting your subjects at risk. Now, our surveys don't typically do that, but I just wanted to mention that because I know that it can be tricky to get at those behavior changes. Um, you can also do focus groups. Um, you know, this goes into a lot of other topics, but I just wanted to mention those briefly. All right. So some of you here may be newer to social media or you may even be a longtime social media user personally, but you're not sure and maybe you're a little frightened of how to do it professionally. So I want to just do a quick poll. And if Katie, you could open the poll for me to gauge your comfort level with social media. All right, so we have 22% say I'm a total beginner, 45% I know the basics, 33% roughly I'm pretty experienced, 2% I could co-host this webinar with you. All right, we have got a good percentage have voted now. Katie, if you could close the poll and share those final results. All right. So more of, you, more of you than not are more familiar with social media, and that's probably why you're attending the Advanced Tips and Tricks webinar. And I want to share that we'll, we'll have a couple tips in here at the beginning to help you gain some familiarity. I'll also share some additional resources if you are a total beginner and want to go a little bit deeper. Uh, I'm excited to see more advanced practitioners here. I would love to receive additional feedback that you have you know, in the comments and the chats that we can share at the end. Um, Katie, if you could hide the results. All right, thank you. All right, so this is a, a slide that I typically include in the 101 level presentation, but I think it's an important reminder is that social media builds public trust. Um, in, in any type of water related issues, we've seen that there, there's a, a challenge in convincing the public that water is safe to drink. And with private well owners, we know that they need to understand whether their water is safe to drink at all. And so your presence on social media as an organization or as an individual 
has the opportunity to build and grow that trust um, if you are following some of the techniques that we share today. If you're absent or <laughs> you know, perhaps less professional on social media, it also has the opportunity to break that trust. And we don't, of course, ever want to do that. So I again wanted to mention that this, whenever I use the word the public here, that's your audience, the core audience that your organization serves. So for a public water system, if you are an operator or a manager of a public water system, your audience, your public is the customers. If you're a health department, your audience is the local community members who are availing themselves of the services of your health department or, or regulated by your health department and inspected by. Um, if you're a state regulatory agency, that's the water and wastewater systems or health departments that are under you that receive guidance and information and regulation from you. And if you're a technical assistance provider, it's water and wastewater systems and it's other community leaders and stakeholders who are engaged in these issues. So it's always important to keep in mind who is your public. I wanted to share this slide briefly here just for those who maybe are less familiar with the different platforms um, and, and, and their kind of various roles and their differences. We'll be going through throughout and I'll mention a couple other platforms as well. Um, Facebook, Twitter are really the, the big boys, the dominant forces here. And if you are new, I recommend focusing on one or two platforms, not trying to be everywhere all the time. Uh, LinkedIn is that place of a more professional context. And Instagram is an interesting place because it is so visual and, and certain organizations um, can, especially if you have a lot of events and you're really public outreach focused, could justify um, spending time on Instagram. But I just wanted to emphasize some of the, you know, the pros and cons and the differences here and reiterating that public, that Facebook is very public focused. Um, you're trying to reach the individuals at the, the ground level, the everyday level, and how they can use your information, come to trainings, um, find out, you know, if there's a line break in the neighborhood or there's a uh, hydrant flushing expected, what is going on and how can you get to that to the most people? Twitter is much more diverse in terms of interacting with different, different sectors and different groups of people. It could be your public, it could be people in your local community, whether or not they're actually stakeholders for this issue, um, or it could be your other peers, you know, professionally speaking, who are the ones that are doing similar things to you and have a similar audience. Twitter, of course, is more limited by the limited number of characters, but of course you can have links. It is very fast paced. Um, so if you have any questions at any time, please do pop those in the chat box and I'll try to um, iron out some of, the, some of those distinctive characteristics for you. But I also wanted to mention on July 29th, I am doing a Social Media 101 webinar for the Illinois section AWWA. And this is free for everyone. So even if you're not in that public water sphere, I want to encourage you, you can sign up for this and attend. Um, I'll be covering in this webinar a lot more of the content specifics in terms of post types, you know, images versus videos, different types and, and themes of content, um, different reasons you want to post content, whether that's awareness or getting someone to take action or kind of more the nitty gritty of the different platforms, how you use them and the different types of content you can post and uh, why you would wanna post those different types of content. Whereas this webinar, as you'll see, is a little bit more strategic and big picture on terms of taking that to the next level. All right, so here's the two big takeaways that you're gonna have today. One is that I want you to be able to feel like you can create content with more confidence, less fear about doing the wrong thing. I want you to feel like that you as an individual or you as an organization can dive in a little bit deeper and be more strategic with what you're doing so that social media is worth your time. And I'll be sharing some ways that you can evaluate that. All right. So the first section here is planning your content. And for each section, I'm gonna be sharing a little bit of what I think the beginner perspective would be and versus the advanced perspective. So in terms of planning your content, a beginner might post when he or she remembers to post and maybe posts a lot really frequently for a while and then stops and kind of forgets about it and comes back, you know, a month, many months, even, you know, years later. Um, there's a little bit of inconsistency there. Whereas the advanced perspective would be thinking ahead so that your posts can be timely, 
so that they're timely to what's going on in the world. If there's a particular awareness event, such as drinking water week going on, you can connect with that. Um, they're staggered so that you're posting consistently, and but there's time between posts. Um, but also staggered so people know what to expect from you. Um, I would say, in my opinion, that it's better to post less often, but more cons but more consistently less often than it is to post a lot during a short period of time and then have large breaks in between. Uh, when you're thinking ahead, you can also be more thorough and planning what visuals you're going to include with the message that you want to have, what type of hashtags to use, and what type of links that you want to include. And I also think that planning allows you to be more nimble, and flexible, especially with your time, when new issues arrive. You know, we've had a lot of event cancellations because of COVID-19. Um, when you have your content planned out, you can say, oh, well, we need to cancel these things. Um, rather than trying to do a retraction saying, oops, we were wrong, planning allows you to uh, jump right in to let people know something that has changed or something that they need to be aware of more. Um, more in the immediate term while also still building that trust through other types of content sharing behind the scenes sharing you know uh, resources that your organization has available and i also think this allows you to be more nimble when there's things going on in the world that require you to be more sensitive with your posts um, if there's times when you need to pause your posts or reschedule them for another time planning ahead will help you be able to jump right in and make those changes uh, more flexibly. So one way to do this is to have an editorial calendar. And I first became familiar with this whole idea when I worked for a newspaper in college. But really, the idea is that you're literally having a document where you're planning out your content and you're doing it uh, collectively as a group or individually for yourself. Um, you can do it on any type of calendar. You could even do it on a paper calendar if that works for you or your organization. Um, a simple online Google Calendar works just fine. You can do spreadsheets, but they tend to not be as visual and you know, time oriented. It's helpful to be able to see on a calendar, so any kind of calendar, how that post, uh, when that post is going to occur. And you can also use more sophisticated project management tools like Asana and Trello and Notion to not only share those posts on the calendar, but to share more details, assign them to others. I mean, you can get pretty geeky about it, but having even just the basic editorial calendar will help you, uh, particularly if you are working in a team of social media posters, whether that's your job title or not, there's more than one of you posting, having a calendar, make sure that you're not stepping on each other's toes. So this is just an example of an editorial calendar that we use in Asana. We've actually sw since switched to Trello for a number of reasons, but you can just see here the calendar view where we have newsletters going out, blog posts, featured videos, and seeing this on the calendar ensures that no one's posting over somebody else or things aren't being posted too close together. We're able to stagger things out. And it also helps to um, batch process some of your work it's helpful to sit down, say, once a month or even once a quarter and plan things out for the future. So again, you can be more nimble when it comes to more time sensitive things. So we had a really great audience question related to this. How do you avoid audience burnout, especially during awareness months? So I think this, this person is talking about an awareness month such as you know, drinking water week, or there could be month long campaigns related to supporting operators. We're seeing a lot of that right now related to um, COVID-19. Could be septic smart week. There's a lot of things that happen where there's an, an awareness event uh, and you're trying to raise an awareness about a particular issue and sharing resources. I think it's helpful to share with your audience that you might be changing the frequency of your posting. You can even say that more than once. Um, on social media, posts tend to be very ephemeral. Uh, only a limited number of people are going to see them within the within a day of you posting. So it's okay to post things again. You can always use different words and share it a little bit differently for those who read it the first time. But to you can never remind people too much. Um, and then maybe after an awareness month, take maybe a day, maybe a two break. But I wouldn't be too concerned about taking a longer break 
because because of that ephemeral nature. I wouldn't worry about it too much because for the most part, most people are not seeing everything that you're posting. Uh, we had another great question. Is it better to use stock images or GIFs for Facebook posts? We're gonna talk more about listening and tracking with metrics. And I would say that testing this is helpful. Um, when it comes to GIFs and GIF, <laughs> when it comes to GIFs, you need to be sensitive to make sure that there's nothing in that that could be offensive. And that's just my opinion. I think it's helpful to, um, like I post a lot of friends gifts because they can be very benign and less controversial. So you wanna you wanna make sure you're choosing your media appropriately. Memes would follow the same thing. You wanna make sure there's no opportunity for misinterpretation. So if it's really clear, then I think those can be helpful and funny and engaging at times, but it's important to be sensitive and kind of maybe ask for a second opinion, like, hey, is there any way this could be read a different way? When it comes to stock images, I like to use those only when I'm accompanying them with different text, such as that I'm putting text over that stock image to um, share a resource or make a statement about something. I don't use as many stock images just by themselves. I don't feel like that's as powerful. It can be even a little bit boring, um, but I understand it's not easy for to always have your original photography. Uh, this day and age in social media, and I would say that it maybe was less so in the past, there's more of a value on realness of content. Um, it's better to post a, a less than perfect image of people in your organization than it is to post a stock image. People, people like to see people. They identify with that. They can connect with that. So I would say have less concern about that perfectionism and more about just helping people see the, the humanness behind your organization. Particularly if you're, you know, you're acting as an organization and you have a logo as your profile, it's really hard to personalize that. And so if you can post pictures of people that you work with or people you serve, of course, with their permission, um, that helps to personalize your organization. All right, another good question. How many videos should I post in a month? I think, uh, as I said before, consistency is more important than anything else. I would, if you're gonna post videos all the time, then tell people what that schedule is so they know what to expect. If you are a video creator, say I'm gonna do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every single week or once a week, I would just have it more in a schedule and make it clear what that schedule is. Even say that in your videos, what the schedule is, than to worry about uh, the total quantity overall. I think expectations are what's really important here. So just kind of highlighting some of the reasons why you want to then schedule posts because you can, planning is one thing, but you can also schedule your posts to be posted at a particular time. So that helps you post at the best time and help and make sure that you don't have to be anywhere at that particular time posting on social media. It helps you stagger that new content to make sure that it's posted with a good buffer around it. Helps you collaborate with others so that you can get maybe get input on that post. You can schedule something for the future and then have a coworker take a look to make sure that you know there's no opportunities to make it better or that you have the right information. Um, if you use a tool to schedule posts, and I'll share a couple of those in a minute here, it allows you to centralize the replies. The com If you're gonna reply to people on your post, which you should be, whether that's liking their comments or replying to their comments, using tools allow you to centralize those replies. And really scheduling posts, just like planning your content, allows you to spend more of that time listening and engaging with your audience, not just broadcasting things out. A little shaky here with my back and forth. So a couple of scheduling tools we have. Of course, now we have native scheduling on both Facebook and Twitter. Um, these tend to provide the best, most consistent results in terms of you're gonna know what the image is gonna look like. You're gonna know if anything's gonna be cut off. There's, there tends to be fewer issues, excuse me. But there's a downside is that they are two different platforms. And if you're using even more platforms, it's more. So it's less centralized. And that's where a scheduling tool can come in handy. Hootsuite and Buffer are two tools that have paid plans, but also have free plans. Both of them allow you to maintain three different social media accounts and schedule a certain number of posts per month for free. So if you're completely new to scheduling, definitely sign up for a free plan, try it out. 
see if it impacts your engagement, see if it impacts your own ability to create content. And then, as I said before, have that time to then engage with the people who are replying to listen to what other people are saying related to your industry and your sector. Um, Hootsuite and Buffer are some of the most popular tools. There are actually a lot of tools um, out there, but they're some of the most well-known. Edgar is another one that I like, and it operates a little bit differently. It allows you to do similar things in terms of scheduling, but it does also allow you to create a content library that makes it easy to share the same content again later. Now, when it comes to events or time-sensitive issues, things that are what we call one-time posts, it allows you to do that, but it also allows you to use what we call evergreen content, meaning this content is always going to be relevant. So a helpful tip such as, you know, on water conservation or not putting fats, oils, and grease down your kitchen drain or down your toilet. So those types of posts you might want to share again every six months or every year and it's helpful to have a content library for that. Now unfortunately Edgar is paid only but if social media is something that your organization wants to really invest into it can be really helpful from that perspective. So here's just an example of um, our Hootsuite account for wateroperator.org. You can see tabs here for Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn and we're able to see you know, the other people we follow on Twitter, we're able to see our own tweets and reply to comments to see who, you know, if there's a comment that we need to reply to, it's all centralized here and we can do that for multiple posts at a time. If we had posts scheduled, you could see them here. We've actually been using, sorry about that, we've actually been using our native scheduling more so than Hootsuite than in the past, but we also are doing some of our listening here and I'll talk more about that uh, right here in the next section on listening strategies. All right, so one of the things I also talk about in the 101 presentation is that social media is about conversations. It's not just about broadcasts. And it's it's difficult to, you think about it as you're just pushing information out. And yes, that is something that it can be helpful for, but that's not the most powerful way to use it. Um, social media is more of a conversation, as I said, but it doesn't necessarily always look like a back and forth, you know, you and me just talking conversation. It can be a larger conversation about we're saying things, other people are saying things about the same issues. Are those lining up? If you're seeing what people, you know, if you take the example of uh, the drinking water in a specific town, we're just going to call it small town, small town USA. If you see that people are using, you know, hashtag small town to say, gosh, why does the water always taste so bad? Why, you know, my water's brown. That's something that you need to be paying attention to, but they're not necessarily going to be tagging your organization. Uh, a lot of people don't have the awareness of really even where their water comes from. So when you can tap into that with listening, you can see what the conversation is happening that may not you may not even already be a part of, but by the fact that you are a stakeholder in that conversation, you need to be a part of it. So it helps you stay aware of issues at all scales, um, trends that are going on, both trends in, in your industry and trends on social media in general by just staying engaged and listening to see what people are posting um, you can see how people do things a little bit differently. And it helps you discover you discover where your audiences are hanging out and the things that they're talking about, the things that they care about, and also even sometimes the way that they're saying it. Uh, as professionals, we all have, seem to have, we have our acronyms and our professional speak, but sometimes we need to make sure that we're using the right language uh, to so that our audiences are really understanding what we mean when we say to do something. And also it helps you find new content to share. Uh, one of the best parts of social media is that you don't need to be always creating the new content yourself. You can find other organizations that share your audience, share you know, your same organizational values, and you can share their content, um, which both benefits your audience and that organization. All right, so we had a good audience question about how do you connect to that right audience? And this is really what listening is going to do for you. It allows you to uh, make sure that you know who is your audience and what are they saying on social media. 
And the more that you do this listening, you'll see whether or not, you know, your, your public is on social media or even which platform on social media and where your peers are hanging out. A long time ago, we did a survey of um, those who were on our email list to see, you know, are you on social media and what is your professional title? And we wanted to see where are people hanging out? And we found that more of our peers are on Twitter than they are on Facebook. And then more of our, our public, our audience, our water operators in that example, they were on Facebook. And so we adjusted our content strategies to make sure we we're talking to the right people in the right location. So a couple different listening strategies here beyond just you know following people, following accounts, other organizations. Um, you can create lists with Twitter, and I'll share an example on the next page, but you can see, you know, some examples of our lists and how we broke them down. You know, people just in Illinois, uh, other partners in the water industry, other organizations serving small communities. When you create these Twitter lists, it helps you kind of group similar content so you can see within this subgroup of organizations, what are they talking about? Um, and what are they caring about? And maybe even how does that compare or contrast to this other subgroup of organizations? It's good for that cross-pollination of, you know, the organizations serving small rural communities. Those are ones that are typically not necessarily water organizations, but they have really helpful beneficial information that our small communities and our audiences serving those communities are interested in. And so by paying attention and, and seeing who the actors are in different spaces, you can just amplify the messages even more and share even more useful information. Mm, excuse me. Another thing you can do is you can like pages as your page on Facebook. I'll show you an example here in a minute. You can follow hashtags on Twitter. You can do that with Hootsuite and other tools. You can just jump to the hashtag page and I'll show you an example of that. Hashtags are also a central part of Instagram and how you can find content that, that's interesting to you. On LinkedIn, you can use groups. Groups are a really interesting way to see, okay, these are people who maybe self-identify as a type of person who belong to a certain organization because uh, these are professional groups. So you can be in those groups and seeing what issues they care about and what they're talking about. All right, so here's some examples of our Twitter list and what those different feeds look like. So this is directly on Twitter and I, I clicked on the list to bring them up and I'm just sharing three examples here. And you can see there's all different types of content from different organizations. And I find it helpful when I'm, say, planning, planning a content strategy to repost content that I, I'm gathering things from different sectors and I'm seeing what things are related. And it's more helpful to me personally to see these different groups together because I maybe want to go on a theme. I want to share a lot of things related to rural communities at once. So I'm going to go to this friends to small water area. And I think anything that you can do to kind of create boundaries and narrow things down is helpful because there's so much content out there. And even with sometimes with hashtags, you know, don't even bother go looking at the hashtag water. Some hashtags are so broad and have so many posts that you won't able, <coughs> excuse me, be able to find anything that's relevant. So that's when it's helpful to create these lists of, of organizations and other accounts that are sharing information that you care about and that's relevant to your audience. So I wanted to share this example of liking pages as your page, because unfortunately, Facebook has made this very complicated, much more than it used to be, but I'm going to share exactly how to do this. But I find it really, really helpful for being able to create a, a content feed similar to what I just showed you for Twitter, but doing that on Facebook. So all professional content from other organizations and also allowing you to engage as your organization, as your page, and not as a person on Facebook. So here's an example on our CAPS page. I went to visit it. And if you click the three dots on the right side, you're able to bring up a menu. And one of the options is like as your page. So you click that and it gives you a chance to select your page. For example, if you have more than one, but if you only have one page, that'll be the one that pops up. And you can like 
that particular page as your page. Now, what does that do? So what that does is actually create a pages feed for you. And this is the part that Facebook has actually buried quite a bit. But if you go to facebook.com slash your page name, and you can just go to your page to see what your page URL is, but then add pages underscore feed after it, you can see what all the pages you have liked are posting. So if you're trying to, you know, gather new content from related organizations on Facebook, this is the best way to do that. Um, and it, it's helpful to, as I said, also it's engaging as your page. It's, you know, you want, you know, creating awareness about yourself is not just in creating that content and using the hashtags. It's also about engaging with others, making comments, liking posts, you know, sharing those posts. That helps other organizations and individuals know who you are and trust you as an organization or individual. And that's kind of some of the stuff we cover more in that 101 presentation. All right, hashtag listening. So a hashtag is that pound sign followed by any word or a phrase, but all smushed together. Um, hashtag listening allows you to stay connected to breaking news. Uh, on the side of Twitter, you'll see trending hashtags. Sometimes they're newsworthy, sometimes not so much. Um, the hashtags can be hyper-local. I'll often follow the Shambana hashtag to find out what's going on in my town. So your, your, your town, your local community may have a hashtag. Um, it helps you understand also the broader context of what people are talking about and using that hashtag. And here's why that's important. I mentioned how if you go to the hashtag water, there's gonna be so many different types of posts, you'll never be able to find anything useful. So that means that if you see what people are posting related to a particular hashtag, you can choose to use or not use that hashtag in order to have the right people find that post. Um, so it's not always as valuable to use the hashtag water. But for example, we have the example here of using CA water, so California water. So what's going on in California? Um, California water, is, these were all very, very relevant posts. And so you wanna do that so that you're using the right hashtag strategically on your content and as well as following the right hashtags that are always going to be valuable to you and valuable to your audience. All right, so I just wanted to share again, this is Hootsuite and on the right hand side here, you can see we're following um, water operators and wastewater operators and we're also following the hashtag water Wednesdays. Um, so that's a hashtag that we found that's really consistently helpful uh, in terms of sharing interesting content. So Hootsuite allows you to create these multiple columns and it, you know, it goes quite a bit to the right. You can add many, many columns uh, to follow multiple hashtags in, in a row and see what people are talking about. And over time, you can change those up. Once you see, oh, well this, maybe this hashtag has drifted into a different thing. You know, that happens a lot. You know, for example, in drinking water, we're talking, we're talking about asset management. Well, asset management in the world means a lot of different things. It could be financial asset management. It's not just infrastructure. So by following the asset management hashtag, you can see what other hashtags then people are using to, to figure out how do I get my posts seen by the right people. So it's all about just listening and paying attention to what people are saying with that particular hashtag because it may not be what you want them to say. All right. This is a question that I've been asked about a lot and I think I have some good ideas here to help you. So I am recommending creating a social media SOP, a standard operating procedure, whether that's even just for yourself, because maybe you might not always be around, whether that's at your organization or not. Um, but particularly if you have a team of people posting on social media, having an SOP is so important for making sure that you can feel confident about what everybody is doing. And so <laughs> this can really help relieve some of the anxiety about how do I do this? And uh, is this going to be perceived the wrong way? Am I doing this the right way? Am I going to get in trouble from, you know, higher ups in my organization? So having this SOP, having it reviewed even so that the, everyone agrees on what these policies are can be helpful. So beginners may not have any guidelines for a team or even themselves. They might have blurred personal and professional boundaries. Sometimes that can get a little bit dicey. Um, Posts can be cross-posted, going up too close together, or even share conflicting information. Maybe you have people working in similar things, but they 
maybe a time was changed on a webinar or an event or a training class. Um, when you have an SOP and you have these other tools such as an editorial calendar and scheduling, you can make sure that the accurate information is posted. And uh, the beginner situation is you may have to have posts removed because someone wasn't on that same page. So the advanced perspective is that your organization is gonna have this SOP so that you can maintain a professional image at all time. And everyone is kind of you know, doing this together and agrees to the same terms. So this doesn't have to be a lengthy document. It certainly can be, but it can start simple and include what outlets you're using, how you're using them, maybe kind of what audiences you're targeting in those particular outfits, and also including the account credentials. What's the username and password so that, you know, if somebody needs to step into your shoes, how can they log in? Because um, this is so important for continuity. And, you know, maybe there is something crazy that gets posted by accident. Worst case, you you know, the, the account gets hacked. Um, someone needs to be able to log in to be able to delete the content at any time. But also can include professional standards for the entire staff. Um, from the simplest terms of, you know, this is how we talk about things. These are the words we use. These are the things that we always spell out or the things that's okay to use an acronym on. Um, you know, even just having the agreement that we are being professional, we're not sharing personal opinions or political opinions. Um, we need to be careful and sensitive to these certain issues. Having these standards that everyone agrees to just puts that awareness in, in anyone who's posting that, oh, I'm this is this is part of my job, just like it would be for any other behavior you have in your organization. Now, of course, we have two different things here that are some of the things I get asked about the most and the more sensitive issues why we need to have these SOPs. And the first one is security and safety issues. Um, it should include policies on posting maps or locations of critical infrastructure assets and policies on posting any preventive security measures and assets. You know, you could have someone who's, you know, a, a go-getter in your community is an excited excited that the town uh, agreed to install six new security cameras and post a picture of where those are located. Um, that's considered a security risk and you don't want to do that. And so having these policies in place, make sure that even, you know, the most well-intentioned posts don't unintentionally cause a, a consequence. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the second part of Advanced Tips and Tricks for Social Media. I want to thank those of you who have come back for a second attempt here. And I do apologize for yesterday's issues. We had a very widespread internet outage. Uh, my two colleagues who were on the line were also disconnected. Uh, and I know I think there were, we had some attendees here in Illinois and in Indiana who were disconnected as well. So it's just one of those things. Um, we're trying to figure out ways to get around that in the future, but hopefully we will um, do our best this time. So, all right, so here is the slide we were on yesterday. And according to the recording, I had just talked about uh, the importance of including security issues such as not posting locations of assets as well as particularly if you have new preventive security measures or whether they're new or old making sure that those are not um, publicly declared because you know you might have someone who's excited that you know there's been investments made in the community but it's important to make sure that those are you know not disclosed and then the next part here is that it's important to include in your SOP policies on whether or not you're going to include faces of those uh, who are participating in your community, coming to your location, coming to events without their permission. Your state may have particular regulations or your locality. Um, one of the best examples that I could think of is a health department, which has lots of different services, and maybe they're coming to you for a well sampling kit, but there's other people at the health department who are there for other reasons, and they may not want their photos taken. So that should be included in your SOP as well. So we had two different questions here that I want to dive into briefly. And I actually got to promise in my, the next time I do this, I'm doing this presentation twice more this year to go into more detail because I admit this is something that I do not have as much experience with. Um, one, do you have any policies in place regarding post and comment removal? And two, can you talk a little bit more about public records and social media policies? So I'm including a link here for you, and this is actually a proprietary service. I'm not endorsing the service, uh, and it's designed for archiving social media records, but this link that I'm sharing um, 
has information about public records laws in every single state, and they even include examples of different social media policies from you know different jurisdictions within that state. So it's going to vary widely in what you're required to do. You're probably already at least loosely familiar with that, and maybe that's even been a burden to your participation on social media. So I definitely welcome your feedback, even some of the strategies that you've used, but I have a couple of pieces of advice to just get started here. So when it comes to these sticky situations, it could be a number of different things. It could be dealing with challenging replies. Uh, and in that case, I'm always looking for this opportunity. Can you help others by providing a courteous reply? And can you also build trust in your organization by providing that reply? Um, by showing that you're aware that you're listening, you're trying to, particularly if it's a, maybe it's a dissenting viewpoint or a complaint, that you're there, you're reaching out and you're doing your best to resolve the situation. You know, we often deal with those things by email, by phone, lots of different ways. And so social media is just another one of those places to provide good customer service, regardless of who your audience is. Um, when it comes to deletion, you know, again, that's going to vary state to state in what type of records retention is required, um, whether and even if you are able to delete a post. Uh, one thing I recommend on Facebook is you actually can hide comments. It doesn't delete them, but it prevents them from being seen. So if there's a comment that you think might cause controversy and that you feel is inappropriate and violates your social media policy, then you can hide that comment instead of deleting it so that it can be retained if you're to get a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, you also might want to think about having a policy on those who post things to your page. That's the example shared here. This is a good example of something that we left because it was an employment opportunity and we try to promote um, the career opportunities within the drinking water profession. Um, but we've also had a lot of solicitation type of posts of here's where you can buy this equipment, come, you know, come follow my thing, and those we have deleted in the past. And you also want to include in your SOP policies on your organization's uh, position and platform on social and policy issues. Some organizations may feel more comfortable and their you know, governance structure will allow to share positions, but maybe not allow to share lobbying for specific legislation. And how do you be really clear with everyone in your team and your organization, whether they're doing social media or not, on how do you share news on social media versus sharing advocacy or, or very clearly biased opinions? And so it's there's a very fine line, and those are important conversations to have. But um, it's something to take into mind because even sources where you maybe you personally agree with everything that's being said and it seems pretty benign, but if that organization has a particular angle, you may want to refrain from reposting them on social media. All right, now we're going to go into this next section. We talked several times before and especially at the beginning about data and how to use the metrics behind your social media to improve your performance. So I want to compare just again here the beginner versus the advanced. So the beginner user may not even be thinking about the data. And if they are, they may be only using it in that kind of self-congratulatory way of, hey, look, we had a post that was great. And I, while I think that's very beneficial and can help to justify that there is effectiveness and you can get reach with your social media activities, but I think it, it undermines the, the true power of using that data um, to improve your reach and improve your overall programming by paying attention to what those metrics say. So one of the questions we received um, prior to the webinar was what is the best type of content for each social media platform? And this is an opportunity here to remind you of all those listening strategies that we talked about yesterday and that there's no way that I can prescribe that you know, on Facebook, you want to post this type of thing and Instagram, you want to post this type of thing. You need to consider the audience that you're speaking to on each of those platforms and you, making, doing experiments and testing and looking at the data to see what resonates and what doesn't. Uh, because it's really going to be totally unique to every single scenario. And, you know, there might be best practices out, out there. And, for example, on Facebook, live video is performing well right now. And those types of things will change over time. But that doesn't always mean that live video will resonate with your audience, that they want to watch that at all, or that you even that even fits your information needs. It, 
is live video something that even fits with what you need to communicate in your social media platforms? So I want to briefly cover how Facebook and Twitter handle their metrics. Um, Facebook's is called Insights. Now, they always tend to move things around, but you just want to look for that word Insights. And on Twitter, it's called Analytics. Here's an example of Facebook, and this is just kind of the first thing that you see when you go into Insights. And this is a summary of your page for the last 28 days. So you can see, excuse me, that we had 108 page views, 6,000 reach, 845 post engagement, and in that time we had posted um, three videos, and we had 25 new followers. And this is, as I said, just the beginning. You can change the time frame, and you can go even deeper into each of these metrics. Um, but if you have to do any reporting, say you have funding agencies or higher ups who want to see what you're doing, this is the first place you can turn to get some of those metrics and to track how things are doing over time. Twitter does something really, really similar, sharing a lot of the same types of statistics. They also show you what some of your top uh, content pieces are in that time. Now here's a comparison of two deep dives further down. On the left, you see Facebook page. On the right, you see Twitter. And these are their displays for individual content pieces. So you can see on the left, we had one Facebook post that had much higher reach and much higher engagement than any of the others that you can see here. And so when you see something like that, you see kind of an outlier, particularly in the positive or even in the negative, you wanna see what makes that one different. How can we repeat that or not repeat that in the future so that we can uh, learn from what is resonating with our audience? And that's what I was talking about before when I was to answer the question about what type of media, what type of content is best. You wanna look for that on each particular platform and see what's working well. This same post here that did so well on Facebook, we don't, I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't see is it. I do not see it here in the screenshot, but it'd be interesting to compare. Did it perform as well on Twitter? Did it have the same type of elevated reach or outlier behavior on Twitter? And if it didn't, that's a good signal that this particular type of content is good on Facebook, but not on Twitter. So those types of comparisons within the tool and between tools are really, really helpful. Now here's an example from our page of why I think it's worth the time to dig into the data and to maybe think about how that impacts or could impact the type of content and how you're posting in the future. So this is for our Facebook page for wateroperator.org. On the top, it's your followers. So these are the people who follow our page. And we can see we have 33% female, 66% male. Now on the bottom are the people who are actually engaging with our page and it's 61% female and 38% male. So that's a really big difference. And while only a percentage of people are gonna be engaging of, with your page of those who follow you, this drastic difference would makes us have a conversation about what is it about our content that is causing this behavior? Or even what is it about our audience that is causing this behavior? The first thing that I would look at is, do women engage on social media more than men in general? I don't know that answer, but that's the first thing I would ask. I would also look at our posts and see, is there something that we're doing that is resonating with women more than men? Uh, it just so happens that Jill, the person on our team that posts the social media is female. So maybe there's something in her, even her design skills and her design preferences that are calling the attention of women more than men. But that's something to have a conversation about and to think about. And this is just one step from within our account that can affect how we do things in the future. All right, next question. How can you evaluate effectiveness without easy access to metrics? So maybe you're in a position of not being maybe the primary social media person or you're maybe contributing content, but you don't always be able, can't always look under the hood. And so I want to share a couple of strategies for that. First off, we have the public metrics, the thing that you don't have to be an administrator for. So in this example on the right, this is one of our best recent posts on wateroperator.org. The number of people reached and the number of engagements, that is something that as an administrator, I would only be able to see. But the number of comments and the number of shares and the number of reactions are something that's completely public. So anyone can look at this post from anywhere in the world and see this had 333 shares, so this was a well-performing post. Um, and another reason this type of thing, public metrics are so helpful, 
is that you can look at what other people are doing. So let's say maybe you're newer to social media. You can see what other people are doing in this space and look at the types of posts that are resonating well and are getting a lot of engagement. I think that type of modeling behavior is really, really helpful when you're learning how to do something just to see, you know, is it, are they posts with images? Do they use a lot of hashtags? And you know, what's the tone? What's the content? Looking at what other people who are really active on social media can help give you ideas of what types of things to try on your own channels. And I also wanted to list here uh, YouTube video views. Unless the creator has electively turned those off, those can be another public metric that can help you uh, see the effectiveness of your, your content. And then I also wanted to talk about surrogate metrics. So these are things that are not specific to social media, but they can reflect the calls to action that you're making on social media, such as enrollments in a class that you're hosting, brochures requested, test kits returned, complaints received. You may already be tracking some of these metrics um, on, elsewhere because of your, all the work you do in your program, but it can be helpful to see if we do a big up ramp, a big uptick in how we're doing social media to see if you see a change in any of these surrogate metrics without any other changes in your program behavior. All right, so I want to kind of share just kind of three, four takeaways here for this analytics. Now, we could have done a whole presentation just on diving into all the data. Uh, I think it's helpful to just start slow by checking this data regularly, even if you're not doing anything with it. Checking it regularly helps you get more familiar with it. Um, you can try testing at different strategies, seeing different types of posts or different posting times. Um, and then you can even start monitoring one or three key metrics over time, even if it's just model, model, um, monitoring your follower growth. You know, do those things. Are you, are you gaining more followers? Are, is, you, is consistency improving your overall reach of your account? And then finally, you can actually share your data with others, whether that's within your organization or with other organizations say, hey, you know, this is what we're seeing here. You know, what do you think is happening? What have you experienced? You know, there's a lot of online communities and we hope to, you know, we can be that for you as well to be able to ask questions and say, hey, what's going on here and how can we do better? All right. Let's dive into the next section here. This one is one of my favorites because I think this is something that's not often talked about. And this is the personal professional profile. Okay, so a beginner may only be posting as a, you know, a faceless organization. There's a logo, word mark type of thing, and they're posting in this very serious professional capacity only. And, and maybe they're only then posting their more personal con content in that personal capacity. So it's very two separate worlds, which for the most part is that it should be. But a personal professional profile is an additional account that lies somewhere in the middle. It provides you an outlet for your professional passions and a way to be on social media as your professional title even when social media itself is not your job title. Because you may be in an organization where there's other people doing social media, but you want to be on social media in your professional capacity, sharing the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and even highlighting what's going on in your organization. So these types of accounts are accounts for an individual. You're on there as a person. You put your picture on there. You put your name on there. You share where you work. It allows you to share your unique perspective uh, and still represent your organization's and mission's values, but as yourself. And, it, and it's in a way for you to amplify your organization's presence and offer more content contribution uh, that they can even post to their account. Because that's one of the things that I hear from people who run organization accounts is they often lack enough content, or maybe they even lack the bandwidth to have enough. But if you can tap into you know, one, two, or a group of individuals with these personal professional accounts in, in your organization, it gives you that much more content and more voices to share. So in the, the picture here, you can see this is from Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and they are just doing a Follow Friday post, which is a common theme on Twitter, uh, highlighting some of the people that are on social media as the, these professional personal accounts. 
So here's an example here of Molly Willosen. She's a climatologist. Um, what's interesting here, and, and I'll highlight this again later, is that the, one of the benefits of the personal professional account is that this, can t this goes with you wherever you are in your career. Even if your bio changes and you end up working somewhere else, this is still you because this is what you do and this is your career. Uh, and so it allows you to maintain the social media presence in this professional capacity that follows you throughout your life. Here's another example of George Hawkins. He's another great example of someone who has made a transition from being CEO of DC Water, and now he's running his own nonprofit. Um, he's always been a really vocal advocate in, in drinking water and, and for uh, smaller communities as well as is really building up the power of larger communities as well and has maintained this, this professional personal account. You know, he's not posting about his favorite sports team, he's posting about things that are relevant to his work, but he's posting as himself. So as I said, these are portable, they're relatively safe for your organization. So these are ways for your organization to allow you to be on social media without giving you the reins to the, the one official account. And, I think this this type of thing used to be maybe not as accepted, but it's growing in popularity um, because it also provides this tool for demonstrating the effectiveness and reach of social media. And fundamentally, social media is personal. It's about people interacting with people. And and I mentioned yesterday that people love people love faces. And of course, when it's your organization, you can post those faces. You can post pictures of yourself and what you're doing and what your coworkers are doing with their permission, of course. But when you make things more personal, you're able to get more reach from that because people like to interact with people. And when you and you make these accounts, I think they often have even more reach and more connections and more followers than the just that one organization account that's big picture. Now, of course, as always, you want to be careful, and this really goes no matter which account you're posting under. Uh, you want to make sure that you have that SOP in place or any other guidelines. And you also want to be mindful of multiple accounts on your phone or your device, what you're working on, making sure you're logged into the right one. Or if you have any apps that auto post, this is an infamous example now of how the US EPA water uh, account um, had an auto post accidentally sent from a phone app game. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen because that reputation is important. And it's something to be mindful of no matter, you know, how or when you're posting on social media, whether as yourself or as the organization. So for these professional personal accounts, which platforms are the best to use? So the examples I've shared have all been Twitter. LinkedIn is another really great example because that is kind of that, it has that professional tone overall. It also allows you to create longer form posts. It can actually be, you know, almost a blog for you. If you have things to say that maybe, you know, you can say in a professional capacity and you want to help elevate your profile and your career, but your organization is not comfortable with you saying that wearing only the organization's hat. It's a place you can do that. Um, Medium is another good example of a content focused community where you can do some of that writing if that's something interesting to you, but you don't really want to have your own blog and then have to go to the maintenance of all that. Um, less good choices in this domain are Instagram and Pinterest. Pinterest, because mostly it's there's not as much of a, a community there. It's more of a search engine tool these days than anything. Instagram could be a good choice if what you're doing is very visual. Let's say that um, you love photography and, and you work in, in you know water quality, as, as some of you do, uh, that Instagram might be the perfect example to express that and to share the outreach events you're doing, even the the recreation that you're doing. If you're an outdoors type person, Instagram might be the right, right thing, but you do have to keep in mind that Instagram, every post is a visual with a caption. Uh, in terms of not so good choices, Snapchat and TikTok are these more ephemeral, uh, entertainment focused channels. I don't think they're good for building a professional presence. Of course, there are organizations doing that, but that's not really where I would recommend you spend your time. And then Facebook is not necessarily a good place for this because it's against their terms of service to create a multiple profiles. So you as a person are allowed one profile on Facebook and they can actually shut you down if they find out that you have more than one. 
So I don't recommend creating an alternate profile to be the professional one, um, just because you always wanna do be on the up and up there. So when you're building your profile, these are Twitter examples here, you wanna make sure that if there's a hashtag that you're using that represents um, a campaign that you're working on, represents your organization, your region, make sure you put one of those. Make sure there's keywords so that people are searching for you, trying to find the types of things that you're interested in that you're gonna come up. You wanna show your affiliation in your profile, that you're a person, yet you are part of this organization and you're proud of that. And then also tag related accounts, particularly if you if you work on other accounts or other accounts that that are from your organization. Um, and I would give this exact same advice to those organization accounts as well, is that you want to use keywords and hashtags and show the affiliations if, in a, in an organizational hierarchy, and to tag other accounts as well. So here's one we have Wake County, North Carolina. They have their Wake is Great hashtag. And then you can see just as this, this is a federal account for IHS, but um, it shows that they're a part of Health and Human Services and they've even linked to their privacy policy and comment policy here. And then finally, I wanna show this example that is probably even less uh, common than talked about is this idea of a hybrid model of a team account. So say you have a small group of people that are within your organization but you guys aren't the ones running your organization's main social media, could you create a team account that you would all contribute to? It allows your group to shine separately than the main organization. So for example, I work for the groundwater section of the Illinois State Water Save Survey. We could in theory create a groundwater section Twitter account. Um, it provides a lot of content options for those big organization accounts to repost. And it takes the focus and pressure off individuals, maybe you're interested, maybe dipping your toes in more, and you have a colleague that's very gung-ho, if you both are contributing to this account, you can maintain that, um, that consistent posting, and then use all the strategies we talked about yesterday with an editorial calendar and um, planning your content to make sure you're not stepping on each other's toes and there's just things going out on a, a spaced out basis. All right, a couple more tips here as we wrap up. Uh, I do want to let you know that I have for the most part included every question submitted in this presentation either already or at the end, but you are welcome to submit additional questions for any time that we have remaining. Um, I just have a, a few more points here. So another strategy that I would consider more advanced is participating in conversations. And what I mean by this is becoming more aware of this broader context and other intersections that you have at, within your organization or within your sphere, what are the other things that are intersecting with that? So an example here is that, you know, for those that are dealing with private wells, this also relates to, you know, public health communicators and behavior change, community health, both, both at the la local and national scale, um, safe housing, which, you know, gets a lot of attention for lead these days, uh, rural access issues. There's a lot of different you know, intersection, intersecting communities that are having conversations and how can you bring, you know, your water voice into those larger conversations. Um, and when you do this, it helps you connect to groups with similar interests to meet new colleagues, find out about new conferences, new things that are going on that maybe you didn't, you, maybe you didn't have that perspective in the past. You know, in contrast to just this one way broadcasting, which we don't want to do, and we talked about that early yesterday, and to just, you don't have to be totally narrow only in your lane. Sometimes your lane is a little bit bigger than you think it is, which can also broaden your reach and get more people paying attention to your issue when you're uh, tapping into these other conversations. So there's two ways to do this. And one of my favorites is to attend Twitter chats. So for a Twitter chat, it's something that's set for a specific time and usually hosted by one organization or maybe there's multiple organizations partnering together for it. There's always a hashtag for it. Um, it often has like kind of questions. Sometimes they're even sent out in advance. So when you reply to this Twitter chat, you want to say my reply to question one is this. Um, and Twitter chats can go really, really fast depending on the number of people tweeting. So it's helpful to not just use the Twitter client, this is even something that I wouldn't recommend using Hootsuite for because it can be a little too slow. Um, for example, this is one called tchat.io and there's been a number of these over the years where you can go log in with your Twitter account and then it's uh, a much faster way to, to monitor a chat and to reply and get your voice into that conversation. 
Another example uh, is awareness events. And we have the example here of septic smart wheat, which happens in September. Um, these awareness events can be of a limited duration, typically a day, a week, sometimes a month, and sometimes there's even longer seasonal campaigns, depending on what the organization is doing. They typically have a hashtag as well. They may even have multiple hashtags. And sometimes they even have available assets. What I mean by that is videos, graphics, logos, things that you can use to, um, put on social media. Sometimes they even have, you know, example social media posts that you can share. So when those events come around, you should dig into the organization that's hosting it and see what's available to kind of jumpstart your, your content sharing. So those are just two examples of being part of conversations. Um, you know, some of the listening strategies we talked about yesterday, those, that's the way to be a part of that longer ongoing conversation when you're following a hashtag over time. Uh, one of the ones that we often follow is value of water and to see who who's talking about value of water, what new resources are being created and how people are uh, in, you know, specific locations educating their communities on the value of water. All right. Again, this is your reminder to submit any final questions that you have for me, and I'm gonna dive into some of the ones that were submitted yesterday. So could you speak to double posting on Facebook and Instagram? So this is one that there's been a lot of, uh, how do I say it? Sometimes the advice is it's not a big deal. And sometimes the advice is it's a big deal. And it all depends on kind of what's happening in that sphere. And I would say this is for the most, this is what happened with Twitter in the past. There was a, a season of using Twitter in which it was highly encouraged to post again because nobody was seeing what you were doing. And then Twitter kind of changed how they were displaying your posts and they recommended not doing that anymore. And they were penalizing you for doing that. Um, my opinion is that if you're going to share content again on either Facebook or Instagram, that you share it in a slightly different way. Uh, and maybe I'm reading your question wrong and I'll, I'll answer it the other way as well. But let's say you want to post uh, an event again. You can use a different graphic. You can use different words. You can say one is saying announcement. Here's this event. And the other one is reminder. Don't forget this event is this date. So taking one piece of information and tweaking it to be more or less time sensitive to adjust the graphics so that it's not the same content posted again. Now, in terms of, I think maybe this question was originally asking, is it okay to say post from Instagram and auto post that to Facebook? And in my opinion, I think that is okay. Um, Facebook and Instagram are actually owned by the same companies nowadays. You can monitor those comments together. You can, if you're doing ad strategies, you can build all that together. So. I don't have a problem with it. I do it personally all the time. And I think it's a way of maintaining a presence in one location um, a lot easier. I don't recommend that be the only way that you do it. I, I would recommend also posting native content. Uh, and that is because each platform tends to give a slight value uptake in terms of display and reach to content that's posted natively. Um, but yeah, I don't have a problem with posting Instagram and having that auto post to Facebook as well. So I answered the same question two different ways. Hopefully that's helpful to lots of people. All right, what was the cost of Edgar? Edgar was that social media um, library tool, a little bit different than Hootsuite and Buffer because it allows you to maintain this library. Uh, it's $19 a month for three accounts and 10 scheduled posts a week, or $49 a month for 25 accounts which you know, often isn't, what, isn't the limitation, but it has allows 1,000 scheduled posts per week. Uh, and there's also nonprofit discounts. Do you have any recommendations for sharing information with non-community water systems? So this is where those listening strategies come out again, because, you know, and we've dealt with this a lot in our, ourselves and, and how do we reach more non-community systems? Because they're, not water systems as their first line of business or why they exist in the world. There's something else first, their businesses, their schools, their churches, their gas stations, their campgrounds, there's all these things that they're not here to be a water system. They just also happen to be. So you need to tap into the organizations that they're talking to on a regular basis to, to run their business, to improve their business. Um, oftentimes at the state and national level, that's where we go to try to get information 
uh, in front of more of these groups, so such as a campground association. How can we get more information about our TCR compliance to these campgrounds? Well, you can tap into other existing newsletters that are outside of water. Uh, and, and those listening strategies can help you discover what some of those things are. So you can even look for the hashtag campground or campground association or, you know, just to see what are they talking about as an organization, as, as businesses themselves. And so you can look for those intersecting communities and opportunities to, to share information. All right, is there any credence to the theory that Facebook operates on an algorithm which defines what posts from identified friends are more likely to come up frequently on someone's timeline? Yes, there is no, it's not a theory, this is a fact. Uh, Facebook and all the social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, everything has an algorithm because there is so much content posted, it is not feasibly possible to show you all of it. So it does its best guess to figure out what you most want to see. So if say, so for example, in the past, I would watch those tasty videos. They're the ones that make, you know, crazy concoctions with, you know, putting all the desserts in one cake, whatever. And if you like those regularly, Facebook's going to show you more of those. And so maybe decide one day you decide, oh gosh, I can't eat that cake anymore. It's just not good for my waistline. Facebook's going to keep showing you those posts until you stop liking them so much. So, and that's what Facebook's algorithm does. Um, they tend to, their algorithm does change over time. It's not just a thing. It's, it's a very complicated system of rules that it's using. And, but that's why anytime you post on social media, you're not gonna get reach from all of your followers. So for example, I run another Facebook page um, outside of water that has about 20,000 followers and my reach averages one to 3,000 of those for any given post. Um, before Facebook updated their algorithm, it could have been 10 or 15,000, but things have changed because of the volume of content that's being posted today. All right, are webinars or virtual town halls more effective? So I think the answer here is what is, what is your objective in hosting this event? Uh, and who is the audience? So if your objective is to communicate information, to teach something, to train something, uh, to help people understand how to do something, then a webinar is that vehicle. It's a little bit less personal. You know, I, I could share my webcam here, but it is less personal because it's just through the computer. Um, there's not as much interaction. You know, we can do the little back and forth with the question box, but it's just not as personal. Now, a town hall, in contrast, implies that you are there to be a listener, that your organization is there to receive information from those that you represent. And so a town hall would use something like Zoom or, you know, you probably could use GoToWebinar if you're, you know, enable webcams, but it's really meant for a ways to solicit information and to make that easy and accessible to everyone to really feel like they're being heard. So I think the platform you choose and even what you call it, even if you're using the same platform, depends on the objective that you want to achieve with the event. My experience with Hootsuite is the only way to get your post scheduled without manual posting is if you're a verified account, at least on Instagram. Have you found this too or a way around this if you are not verified? So this is something that is unique to Instagram because Instagram has only allowed a select number of basically tech partners to, to do auto posting. And Hootsuite at this time is not one of those. Um, so, you know, with... Uh, Instagram and Hootsuite, it will give you a notification and then you can post that thing manually. But there are other tools. One of the ones I like is called Planoly. Um, Later is another example that is allowed to automatically post to Instagram. And so that's just something that's really unique to that particular platform. Um, I wasn't aware, actually, I wasn't aware that verified accounts could get around that. So you just want to maybe think about other ways of doing that if Instagram is, is a part of your social media strategy. Um, in the past, I've, I've never personally ever used one tool for all three, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram together. All right, what is the best way to engage your audience? Well, and this, this is a good opportunity to kind of sum up some of the things here is that it's to, you know, to be listening, to test different strategies, test different content, um, and really find out who wants to see what content and what location and what resonates best. 
Um, and the only way to do that is just to get out there and try and to look at the data. Yeah. Oh, I guess I also wanted to say on that one is that I remind you again of the July 29th Illinois Section AWWA webinar. That is a 101 webinar. Uh, in August, I'm doing this 102 webinar for um, them as well. And then I'll be back here, um, at the joint webinar for wateroperator.org and private well class doing another advanced tips and tricks webinar. So a lot of the same content, but it'll be all new questions. And that's one of the things about all of our webinars is that even if the topic is the same, you know, we always get different questions and we work do our best to incorporate those into the presentation and of course answer those live on the call for you. So here's my contact information. Um, we have one question that's come in so far, but this is your chance to submit any additional questions for me to answer. Uh, we have one of where can you learn more about this topic? Um, this was submitted right after our conversation about Edgar. Um, they have a helpful blog. Uh, there's a lot of um, blogs out there that are just on social media. Social Media Examiner is one that I have followed in the past. Um, there's also a lot of, there's not as much social media related to public entities, but there are, there's a lot of social media, uh, let's see, training tutorials, blog posts, and advice related to nonprofits. Now, you tend to you probably ignore a lot of the advice related to the fundraising aspects, but some of the other attributes are often helpful in that sphere as well. Um, yeah. That's the best thing that I can say. And just to do, to use those same listening strategies. You can look at the hashtag social media uh, to see what people are talking about. Um, yeah, and if you need any additional resources, please feel free to reach out and I can try to find something that's more personalized to what you're looking for. All right, any other questions? Um, can you tell me anything about the use of algorithm on, space, on Facebook? Well, I, I, I'm not sure to really tell you more other than, um, you know, using when you test, when you look at your data, you can see which posts are performing better. That might change over time. So just because the data shows something this year, it might show something different next year because Facebook has changed their algorithm. That was the case with the live video example that I had posted before. They changed things to prioritize live video so that people could be notified and hop on live when you're doing something like that. Um, whereas live videos prior to that, the function was there, but those posts weren't getting as much reach. Um, so it's important to both pay attention to your own data and to maybe just keep tabs on trends in social media. Um, for a good example with Instagram is that, you know, even though I don't use the service later that I mentioned, it's called later, I subscribe to their emails because they provide really helpful information about uh, new features on Instagram, new trends, what's going on, how and how things are performing you know, more generally across all users. And so you can tap into different services like that, whether or not you use them. You know, I'm sure Hootsuite has a newsletter as well, to, and they will share helpful information to, to keep you abreast of those changes. All right. Well, please feel free to reach out to me directly, uh, find us on Twitter. Um, I know some of you actually liked and commented on our post yesterday, right after we got disconnected, I commented on Twitter and Facebook for all four accounts to let people know what was happening. And I appreciate you reaching out there and sending us emails as well. A reminder that if you do need a certificate to email info at wateroperator.org and we will get you connected to that. Um, if you have any specific questions, include those in there. And if you are a NEHA credential holder, please include that in your email so that we can uh, get you the form to fill out so that you can get your CEs for that. And with that, I thank you all for returning. I'm so glad to see such a great turnout for our second edition. And I look forward to talking to you soon about social media. Take care, guys.